I've been fortunate enough to have reviewed almost all of Nokia's latest devices, and if you had been watching those reviews, then you'll know that I'm a big fan of what they were doing, and I'm always excited to check out their new releases. However, when they sent over this new Nokia 9 PureView, I felt the greatest sense of excitement that I've ever felt for any Nokia device, simply because of just how different it is. Now, when I say that it is different, I don't just mean for Nokia themselves, but rather that it's a device which tries something new instead of playing catch up with other devices. So does new and different mean better and does the device live up to the hype? Well, there's only one way to find out. The overall design of the Nokia 9 PureView is not too dissimilar from Nokia's other more recent devices. If we look at the side profile, for example, the color contrasted beveled edges are rather similar to what we've seen on the Nokia 7.1 and 8.1. The previous flagship, the Nokia 8 Sirocco, took a very different approach, as it offered super slim and sharp angles on the side along with a curved display. I think whilst the design of the Sirocco is arguably more interesting, the Nokia 9 just feels more familiar and more practical. On the front, we are treated to a really lovely 6-inch POLED display, which boasts a very crisp pixel density of 538 ppi. Oddly enough, there is no notch here, nor is there a hole punch design for the front-facing camera. No, instead Nokia have just gone for a more traditional display whilst attempting to maximize the screen-to-body ratio. I have to admit that this design does make the device feel just a little dated. Heck, even the budget-friendly 7.1 has an ever so slightly higher screen-to-body ratio and it just looks a bit more modern. I suppose Nokia did at least go for rounded corners rather than sticking to right angles. As you would expect from an OLED type display, the contrast ratio is fantastic and the color rendition is really nice. I do prefer Nokia's approach as the colors seem more natural rather than trying to get this ultra punchy, almost cartoonish vibrancy that we've seen from the likes of Samsung. There's also an in-display fingerprint reader, which is the first time that this tech has been used on any of Nokia's devices. It works, but we'll cover the reliability of it when we discuss how the device performs as a daily driver. Along the bottom sits the speaker and USB Type-C charging port, and the top houses the SIM tray. The left side has been left bare, whereas the right side has the power button and volume rocker. You'll notice that there is no headphone jack this time. Nokia have been pretty good thus far in keeping the headphone jack for their other devices, but it seems the Exodus has come for their latest device as well. Personally, I don't really mind the exclusion of the headphone jack simply because Bluetooth audio is improving at a really rapid pace. As a result, there are a bunch of devices that can give you really good wireless audio such as Fios BTR series and Shanling's Up and Up 2 and then the super popular ES100 from Eosonics to just name a few. And if you really want to step up your portable audio game, you're likely to use something like a Dragonfly, Mojo or perhaps an XDSD, in which case a headphone jack on the mobile device itself would be completely irrelevant. However, should you insist on not using a slightly more bulky external device, then there is a convenient little DAC amp cable included in the box. Another thing which seems brand spanking new for Nokia is the fact that the Nokia 9 has an IP67 rating for dust and water protection, which is pretty sweet. Oh, hang on, there's also support for wireless charging as well, but unfortunately there's no wireless charging pad thrown into the box. Okay, I think we've beat around the bush for long enough now because the entire purpose of this device can be found on the back in the form of that almost alien-like camera setup. The camera setup on the Nokia 9 PureView is unlike anything we've ever seen from Nokia. It is certainly the star of the show here and as such I'll be focusing the majority of this review on the imaging capabilities of this device. There is a total of 5 cameras, 3 of which can only capture black and white images and the remaining 2 capture RGB images. The great thing about doing this is that the color sensors allow you to capture, well, color, but the black and white cameras are equally useful because they allow you to capture the entire brightness spectrum between pure black and pure white. This is what we refer to as dynamic range, and the more dynamic range a sensor can capture, in theory, the more accurate the images will be by capturing not only the color information, but also the varying degree of brightness of those colors detected within a scene. 
In addition, it also means that you can capture true black and white photos, rather than relying on some kind of software trickery to convert a color image into a black and white one. Of course, the proof is in the pudding as far as how effective this arrangement is for color photography, and in this case, this seemingly over-engineered approach has allowed this device to capture a dynamic range which rivals some of even the best DSLR cameras out there. With a total of 12.4 stops of dynamic range, the Nokia 9 can capture some incredibly accurate color information. But dynamic range is not the be-all and end-all of image quality, and this is where we start to see the shortfall of this device. When we start taking a look at some of the captured JPEG images, we can see quite a lot of over-sharpening. The colors look great, but the sharpness can at times look rather artificial. Capturing images in RAW format, on the other hand, does give better imaging results. In low light especially, this device produces very little noise. Using the RAW format will, as far as I'm concerned, nearly always give you the best results from any camera that supports it. But because the RAW format means that you are saving the data exactly as it is captured by the sensor, that takes up significantly more storage space, and it requires much more processing power as well. If we relate this to digital audio, RAW would be equivalent to a WAV audio file, whereas a JPEG would be similar to the LAME320 MP3 audio format. Because of the sheer amount of data being collected, processing that data has proven to be rather taxing on the Nokia 9 PureView. The thing is, when you take a picture, all five cameras are being used. That's a lot of data to process, especially if you are taking these images in RAW format as well. The result of this is that if we were to take an image and then head on over to have a look at the preview, there is a significant processing delay, sometimes even ridiculously so, before you can actually view the image. There is actually just so much processing going on in the background that you can physically feel the device warming up, so that's not particularly ideal. However, what I am most disappointed by is the fact that all five of the cameras are exactly the same in terms of being 12 megapixels along with a focal length of 28 millimeters and an aperture of f1.8. This is a real shame because if they perhaps had different focal lengths, well then that could make this device just way more versatile. Imagine if you just had a single device and with five different lenses you could capture really close macro shots and then switch over to a telephoto lens and snap a shot of something really far away. That would be pretty damn cool, wouldn't it? I think that's where things will head towards as we see more and more manufacturers adopt this crazy multi-lens sensor approach. Granted, that would probably give the device a bit of a camera hump on the back though, so for the time being, the camera array found on the Nokia 9 is not quite where it needs to be yet. But in all honesty, this is to be expected whenever a groundbreaking form of technology is approached. There will be teething problems and there will be inefficiencies in the beginning as this rather new concept is tested out for its limitations and possibilities. And in that regard, I think it's still worth giving Nokia a pat on the back for a very good first try. Okay, so we've dealt with the five cameras, but if we look on the back, we can see a total of seven objects. Obviously, one of them is the flash, but the other is what's called a time of flight sensor, or TOF for short. If you are unfamiliar with what it is, the clue is very much in the name. What it does is to measure the time delay between sending a signal and then again receiving the reflected signal back. Now, if you think back to your high school physics class, you'll remember that the speed of a moving object is calculated or measured by taking the distance it is traveling within a certain period of time and then dividing that figure by the exact same period of time. But if you do not know what the distance is, but you do know the speed at which the object is traveling, then you can rearrange that formula and calculate the distance by multiplying the speed by the time, which is exactly what a time of flight sensor does. Basically, it works the same way as radar and sonar systems, apart from the fact that a radar system uses radio waves and a sonar system uses sound waves. In the case of a time of flight sensor, 
it uses some kind of artificial light produced by a laser or perhaps an LED. So because we know what the constant for the speed of light is, the TOF sensor then emits a beam of some kind of light and then waits for the beam to be reflected back to it. And then that time delay divided by two is how far the object is away. And that is then used for various depth of field algorithms used by the software. It's a pretty clever approach, and by capturing this data, the device can then plug it into algorithms to apply various depth of field effects to the captured image. So that's the camera dealt with. Now let's take a look at the rest of the software. The Nokia 9 is running Android 9 Pie, and like essentially all of Nokia's latest devices, it is part of the Android 1 program, which gives you a practically unadulterated version of Android in much the same way as Google intended for Android to be. It's almost like having a Pixel device, but without paying quite the price of a Pixel device. Although, I must admit that each time Nokia releases a new flagship device, the price does seem to increase. But it's still not as costly as flagships from the likes of Samsung, and nowhere near the price of Apple's latest devices. Now, with the Android 1 program, you're also basically in the front row with regards to getting the latest Android security and software updates. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I like the fluidity of the software, the cleanliness of the design, but above all, that there is absolutely no bloatware. There's a certain refinement in the simplicity that I find very appealing. I've reviewed a fair number of Nokia's devices now, and I was and still am a big fan of all of them. Heck, I even liked the 7.1 enough to purchase one for myself with my own money, and I will continue to recommend these devices to pretty much anyone who is just looking for a great value-packed device. No, you don't really get the latest hardware specs, but they are still really solid devices that feel high quality, but without breaking the bank. And above all else, I found them to be really reliable. But unfortunately, this is where the Nokia 9 has bucked the trend for me this time. This should be the best device Nokia has to offer, and in some cases it really is. But when I look at it as a complete package, well, it just feels a little incomplete. Yes, the camera is exceptionally close to what I would call truly excellent, but it also feels unfinished. It is as though they could have and should have done just a bit better. I can't help but feel as if this over-engineered camera setup is just not being used to its full potential. Then there's the camera software, which, as it appears anyways, is essentially the same as is used by all of Nokia's other devices. That in itself is not a bad thing at all. In fact, I quite like the simplicity of it, but it feels as though Either the software or the processing hardware isn't quite up to the task of handling the mass amount of data captured by these cameras. Maybe if Nokia did opt to use a newer Snapdragon processor, then this problem would have been less noticeable or perhaps even avoided altogether. But again, if you can look past this, then the Nokia 9 really can give you some great photos. There is one detail with regards to the hardware that I have not mentioned yet, and that's just because it kind of ties in with the software as well. Something I really appreciated with Nokia's other devices is the support for expandable storage. But in the case of the Nokia 9 PureView, there is no option for that at all. This just seems like a ridiculous omission in my opinion. On the one hand, you've got this really powerful camera setup, but then on the other hand, there's no way to increase the amount of storage at your disposal. Yes, we do have unlimited storage on Google Photos thanks to the Android One program, but that is only for high quality images. Now, this is a little misleading because we need to understand what is meant by high quality in this particular case. When you take an image, that image can then be saved in a high quality JPEG format, which is a lossy format in the same way that MP3 is a lossy audio format. Or, in the case of the Nokia 9, you have the option of capturing and saving the data in RAW format as well. A JPEG image has undergone a lossy data conversion, rather than just a compression, and that's why it's significantly smaller than a RAW image. The actual data has been changed, not just rearranged to save space. However, the high-quality images for which you can get unlimited storage on Google Photos does not seem to include RAW photos, and it might even be recompressed versions of already compressed JPEG images. 
This is true for all of Nokia's devices that are part of the Android One program. If we head on over to the backup settings for Google Photos, we can see that you have the option of backing up the photos in high quality or original. If you select original, then that will take up whatever storage allowance you still have on your Google account. So just don't make the mistake of thinking that you get unlimited cloud storage for your images in the same quality as what you took them with a the camera. Then there is another issue which is likely to affect anybody who uses the device and that's the fingerprint reader which can be ridiculously temperamental. Sometimes it'll register my fingerprint with complete ease and at other times it'll fail so many times that it resorts to me having to enter the security pattern or PIN like an absolute Neanderthal. Granted, these issues could very well be improved or completely fixed with just a software update, but I also feel that they should not have been present at all once the device hits the market, especially not on a flagship device. So as a daily driver, I really, really did want to love the Nokia 9, and maybe after another software update or two I will, but for now at least, it's just not quite there yet for me. Normally, the value of Nokia's devices is fairly easy for me to judge. As I said, I've come to expect their devices to be very well built, decently spec'd, reliable, and with a price tag that won't make your eyes water. The Nokia 9, on the other hand, does not feel to me like it's ticking as many boxes as the other devices, even though it is largely a better spec'd device. There are certain aspects that just make it seem like it's not quite thought out well enough. As I said, I think the camera setup itself is a really good first try for Nokia, but things like the lack of expandable memory impacts the overall usefulness of such an advanced camera setup. To some extent, it feels a bit like it's a product of compromises rather than a full-on flagship to say, hey, look at this, look at what we can do. But I'm still optimistic. It'll be really interesting to see where Nokia goes from here how they expand and refine this technology into a device which is just as rock solid and value packed as their non-flagship devices. The Nokia 9 PureView is also somewhat of a limited edition device, so maybe there will be a second iteration which will have all of the hardware niggles sorted out, but until such a device is actually released, well, we can only speculate whether or not that will actually happen. Thanks for watching, that's all from me for now, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.